and it says, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And that was the end of the Old Testament. That was how God ended the Old Testament. And for 400 years, we moved into a new dispensation. So what did he mean by that? In fact, if we look at the book of Malachi, Malachi is divided into three parts. Okay, this, that, those last passages there, they are actually divided into three parts. Okay. And the first part, you know, because those are the three areas that Malachi wants us to focus on. But out of those three parts, I will focus on the last part. Okay? Because the, the, the first part of that focus is in verse 4. Alright? Because what is okay, he used the word remember. Okay? And when you saw Shun, I talked about Moses, right? So I just want to give you a quick background of where I'm coming from. And he talked about Moses. He says, remember. When he says remember, every time somebody says remember, it's a point of reflection, right? Because the book of um, of, of those verses are talking about looking forward or looking back to God's you know revealed word. He's talking about looking forward, you know, to God's um, final victory and also considering the efforts of God's merciful um, word. So those are the three areas there. But what, then in verse 4, it talks about remembrance. So what God was telling to the children of Israel, he was telling them to remember the Ten Commandments of Moses in the book of Exodus chapter 20. Because if you read from verse 3 all the way down, that was the Ten Commandments. Okay? So that's what he was talking about there. Trying to bring them to a point of where they are presently to where they are going. Because sometimes it's good for you to go back and see, you know, maybe the mistakes you have done or maybe lessons you can learn and bring to the present and say, you know, how you can rectify that as you move forward into the future. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you say the past doesn't matter, the present, you know, the future doesn't matter, the present matters, is what matters. Yes, it's what matters because that's where you are in that moment in time. But you've got to have some point of reflection in order to move forward. Okay? So that's what, you know, um, that's it. Because it also talks in Luke 17, it says, remember Lot's wife, all right? So again, God was taking the children of Israel to a point of reference. Wants them to reflect about what happened to Lord's wife for disobedient. All right? So remember is a point of reflection for us as children of God. All right? And so, and the second thing that the, the, the second focus there is on verse 5. All right? Because verse 5 really is talking about looking forward to God's final victory. And remember, if you go back, when we, we study the book, we still study the book of Revelation, all right? I'll get back to Revelation next week, or when next, you know, I preach. But um, even if you go back to Revelation chapter 11, all right? Talking about God's final victory, all right? Who were the servants that God sent, you know, to earth? He was talking about Moses and Elijah, right? And we know what happened with the Antichrist with Moses and Elijah, all right? They thought they had defeated because they, you know, they, those, those, those prophets were killed. And they laid there for three days, but they rocked. But then what happened was that, what happened? They resurrected. They came back to life. All right? So again, God wants to remind us of the victory, the final, the, 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 the final victory. All right? So that's why he mentioned in verse 5 about Elijah okay, and Moses. Because again, those two people appeared in Mount Sinai. Okay, the scripture will say Mount Horeb, but Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same. Okay? It's Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb, so don't get confused. So it's a little bit of Bible study here before I move forward. Okay? Right. So, so that's important because those two, Moses and Elijah, they met twice. I mean, at the, 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 you know what it is? The mountain transfiguration? Okay? They met there as well where Peter says, you know what, we should actually build a tower here. All right? So again, God was trying to talk about the final victory, all right? But the one we're going to focus on today is considering the efforts or the effect of God's merciful word, all right? He says the relationship between father and children. So that's what I'm going to focus on today, amen? But I just wanted to give you a synopsis of, you know, the last four verses of um, the, the last book of the Old Testament. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So now I start my message. So my theme for today is the presence of the Father. Okay, and I, I'm going to make a confession here. 
It's a difficult um, subject for me to preach because I have been an absent father. So it's not an easy um, subject for me to preach on. Okay? But I have to be honest and I have to be candid and I have to be transparent to preach the word of God. Amen? So when I was preparing this sermon, I was in tears. Because why? I reflected. I remembered. But I just thank God for his grace. Amen. Amen. I thank God for his grace. That the relationship between us and our children, our children are now a great relationship. Mm. But there was a price to pay and it took many years mm. to rebuild that relationship. So this someone has was preparing it. If I burst into tears, okay, you understand why. Mm. Amen. So I'm speaking to fathers today, absent fathers today. Amen. 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 And I pray for those of you who are fathers, do not be an absent father. Mm. All right. So today I just want to say, you know, a um, special thanks to all the fathers who are out there. We honor you and we thank you for all that you do. It is not easy to be a dad, be a father, but it's worth it. Amen. Mm -hmm. And most of us have been in that occupation for many, many, many years now. And some of us who just started, but I assure you, it's worth it all. Say, Father, it's not just a name, it's not just, it, it, it carries with it a great responsibility, right? And I just want to include in that definition, you know, of fathers, I want to include stepfathers, adopted fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, fathers to be spiritual fathers, because there are little ones out there who are looking up to us, you know, for direction and guidance. But um, fathers, do you have a job description? How to be a father? Do you have a job description? We don't have a job description. I came up with one. Okay? Because here is part of the job description of a father. That a father has to be a protector. You see, dad wants to protect their children from being hurt physically, emotionally, and they protect their home from intruders. And that includes keeping evil spirits from entering their home. Amen? Amen? And I'm sure for fathers, especially when it comes to their daughters, they get very, very, very protected. Right. And imagine when your daughter's at that age when she starts dating, and the, you know, the young man knocks at the, on, on the door to come and take your daughter out. And I'm sure the dad will call that daughter and give the son the boy and say, sit down, boy. You know, let me see your driver's license. <laughs> What's your address? What's your father's name, your mother's name? You know, I will, you grill that boy, right? Where are you taking my daughter to? To dinner, sir. Can you give me the address of the restaurant? Yes, sir. And I want my daughter back here at you know half past ten on the dot. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. And then by now this boy is shaking and the daughter is going. You know, dad is interrogating. Right? He's a protector. Alright? And as soon as the son leaves with the daughter, dad calls the Uber. Follow that car. Follow that car. Dad will sit in the Uber watching food guys to see what, what is happening. And as soon as they're about to leave, dad will drive home quickly, go upstairs, looking through the window, turn off the lights, watching. And as they're coming, you come to the door. <laughs> but that's fathers, right? right huh? Protecting. Because when the father sees the, 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 the young man coming home to take his daughter out as the evil spirit. <laughs> that's a joke. All right. <laughs> But that's one of the functions of the father, if you like. The father is also a provider. All right? And this is a challenging, you know, it's challenging for fathers because to be a provider and be present at the same time, you know, takes some, some skills to do that. All right? And when I talk about being present, I'm not just talking about, you know, being physically present. I'm talking about being emotion, you know, emotionally present as well. All right? So dads have to have a balance between providing and being present in that home. 
Okay, so that's going to be a balance there. And that's also teachers. You know, they teach the word of God to the children. Every opportunity that they have, they will use it to teach the children. They are also trainers. Whether they were trained to be trainers, they become trainers when they have children. You know, little Johnny is riding a bicycle, the two wheel bicycle dad is behind him holding the bicycle, telling him how to pedal, what to do, and what not to do. You know, playing basketball, don't you? You know, dad is there to support and train the, 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 the children. All right? We're also talent developers. Because dads will spot some talents in their children. And they'll have to nurture and develop that talent in their children. Dads do that. Amen? Amen. And mothers don't look at me like that. Okay? <laughs> they are also the priests of the household. Spiritual leaders in their homes. Setting examples. Bringing in the word of God. Pray with their children. Having morning devotion with their children. Amen. That's the job of the father. They are also playmates. They tell stories. And when the father becomes a grandfather, guess what they do? They spoil their grandchildren. They run around and spoil them rotten because it's now the responsibility of the parents to bring up their children, right? That's the fourth part. Amen? Amen. And they are also servants. Fathers are servants. And Jesus said, greatest among you should be the servant of all. But do you know fathers are also the weathermen? Do you know that? You see, when the temperature gets heated in the house, that regulates that thermostat. Right. That's what the father does. He regulates it. When it gets too cold, he heats it up a little bit. Amen? Amen. Why are you smiling so much? But I gave a compliment to you. Amen. You know? So, you know, when we, when we apply for jobs, and they give us a job description, and at the bottom of that job description, it says that any other duties has been required. All right? So, you know, there's a pattern of things that we, the fathers, can do. All right? We're not just complainers. We do do the right things. Amen? amen. Praise God. Amen? amen? The women are not saying amen. Amen? amen. amen. <laughs> but on a serious note, if there's ever has been a time that we need men to step up, it is now. We need men to step up now. Because the most important responsibility of a father is to be present in the home. Amen. And the presence of the father in the home is not just physically being there, but you have to be emotionally, mentally, and spiritually being there for your family. Amen. So when, when we look at the condition of the country we live in today, I mean, the, the world at large, I would think, you know, and I'm sure we'll all agree, that this nation, not just America, but the world at large, we need prayers. Okay? Because why? We have fallen from the godly principles. Okay? We have we have, we, we have forsaken the word of God. We have taken things into our own hands. We've allowed evil to prevail. We have, we have abandoned our responsibility of stewards of the, of the earth that God has given to us. And so, what has happened? There has been a breakdown of the nation. And the breakdown of the nation starts from the home. That's where it starts from. Where there's a breakup in the marriage. There's abuse and neglect in the home. Where there's domestic violence in the home. Where the children rebel against parents. Where we succumb to the changing you know, of how family is defined. Not the way that God defines it, but the way society defines it. And when we succumb to that, then we begin to see that the family is degenerating. Things are breaking up in the homes. See, God gave us a structure of how to run the family. How to run our homes. But today we are not following those structures. We've got our own defined structure to run the homes. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it's affecting the family. Amen? Mm -hmm. And I'll say this again. God comes first. Your family comes second. The church comes third. You can go back on WhatsApp and write about me. But I will say it again. Because it is the home that comes to church. It's not the church that's going home. Yes. While you bring up your children in your respective homes, they come in to make the church. Yes, sir. Look, we, 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 we hear, you hear a particular statement say, like I was listening to you know, um, 
the, the, pres the, the, the former president who's working in the community and he's got a group of black people he's working with. And these two people were saying, well, in this state, in the community I come from, they are all drug dealers. In the community I come from, these people are gangsters. Hmm. Where did it emanate from? It's from the home. If you don't take care of your children, the state will take care of them. Yay. Amen? Amen? So all those who know that are affected by it. So if your children are mingling with people who are not well brought up, it's affecting your children. Yes. Not only that, but the people who know the people who are being affected are also being affected. It's a chain game. Am I clear? Yes. And it goes on and on. And it is time for us to come together as families and take back the community for God again. Amen? Amen. Amen. And not only that, but God is raising up spiritual dads and moms that are ready to be present for the next generation. And that's why the children's ministry is important as well. Okay, it's only one day in a week for a few hours. But that's what the church can do, contribute, help. And that's why, you know, Pastor Lucena is encouraging the parents when they give them homework, go home, teach your children. Because if you miss the foundation, it then it's, it's difficult to build up a weak foundation. So children's ministry is extremely important. The teaching, what has been inculcated in those children is what is going to make them the men and women they are going to be in future. And I will say to the youth, you serve in the church and I appreciate all you do online. But serve in the church as well because it is where you build what it takes to be a servant of God. Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes. Don't get mad with me. All right? Thank you. Look, we, we, we need direction in the world today. All right. We need direction. Because what is going to come out of this mess of a world that we are experiencing now are those, you know, that don't don't they, don't they don't look like us. Because people don't look like you. They don't dress like you. They're not in the same you know social you know strata as you. They look different, they smell different. Because of that, we look down upon them. And because of that, there's a demarcation. You know, and, and that's the mess we find ourselves in today. But I believe that God is raising spiritual dads and moms, you know, care for those people. Mm -hmm. What am I saying? Church, somebody will walk into this church today, doesn't look like you, doesn't dress like you, doesn't smell like you. Do we just turn our noses away and from them? Do we embrace them and nurture them and bring them to, to the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Do we do that? Or do we say, or not in the same class. Or not in, you know, is that how what Christ did? No, he didn't. Amen? Amen. So let's take a look at this profound promise that God gives us in his word. In Malachi chapter 5 and 6, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And verse 6 says, And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest, and the, you take note of that word, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. All right. Well, some translation will say, instead of father, they will say parents, you know, and I can appreciate that because it takes both mother and father, you know, to have a harmonious home, and I can appreciate that. But I, I also believe, you know, that it is deliberate that God uses the word father because the single most powerful force in the home is the father. You know, the relationship that we have or have had uh, at the fathers affects us the most. If I we look at, you know, um, the census that was carried out some years back, it said 19.7 million children, that's more than one in four, live without a father in the home. Hmm. And consequently, there is a further factor that is nearly all social ills facing America today. And not just America, but in the world today. All right, the presence of the father is vital 
it is extremely vital. So in this passage of scripture, it, 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 it seems that unless the heart of the fathers are turned to the, to the children and the children to their fathers, we're going to have a problem. Amen? You know, somebody once said that the prophet comes with a warning. And in the Old Testament, the prophets did come with warnings. All right? But you can change the outcome of that warning. Remember the book of, you know, Hezekiah? The prophet came with a warning to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was able to change. All right? So this is a warning for us. It's the first few words in the Old Testament before the new dispensation. Okay? So, again, it is up to us to make that change, you know, to, 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 to really move that clock and to save the day. Amen? Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing here. The, the key here, as I said, the key word here is less. Or the other word for less is unless. Okay? Say unless. So, what is God saying is that the key to saving the earth, the key to saving our nation, the key to saving our cities, our communities, is found in the restoration of the family. Okay, that's where it is found. And the key to the restoration of the family has to do with the heart and the entire home turning to the Lord and turning to each other in love. That is the key. All right? I know we're all waiting for the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But before Jesus comes, we should be coming together as fathers and raising our children, turning our hearts to our children. And how do you do that? There's forgiveness, there's salvation, there's healing, reconciliation, restoration of the whole. We need revival in the whole. Hmm. Amen? Hmm. I, I, I want to read a story. It's a story I found, and I'll read this story to you. Okay? It's a story of redemption. It's a story of forgiveness. This is a story, you know, it's full of God's power. And this is a story of how God mended something that was broken. And this is what this young lady wrote, and I'll read. So when I was five years old, my parents got divorced. Unfortunately, this is not something that's uncommon in our day and age. Heartbreaking, but not uncommon. As a little girl, I was not really sure what happened or what was going on. I lived with my mom, and I was able to see my dad every Tuesday for Daddy's Day and every other weekend. Mom and I ate a lot of mac and cheese. We watched a lot of VHS movies and on our 12-inch television. We made a lot of great friends in the apartment we lived in. We jammed to music in the car. Dad and I ate at Chick-fil-A or Captain D's every Tuesday. We made frequent trips to the library to check out um, fun chapter books for me to read. We went to visit my grandmother's house on the weekends where I would play in the pool and feed the horses. This was the norm. This was all that I was able to see with my young eyes. The reality was that God was doing a work in the relationship of my mom and dad. He had a plan. It was full of motion. It was one that requires a lot of faith and a lot of patience. Behind the scenes, my mom had been praying for my dad. He was not on the best path, and he was running from the Lord. She felt like the Lord wanted them to get back together. She faithfully prayed for him. She prayed for restoration. She prayed for my dad to run back towards Jesus. She even approached him multiple times, but getting back about getting back together. But even then, rejection didn't stop her from trusting what the Lord had planned. Then my dad hit a place near rock bottom. He fell on his knees before Jesus. And just like I remember, my parents were getting back together and getting remarried. The journey they went through and the confidence they had at the power of the Lord Jesus Christ is something that I did not realize on, when, until I was a little bit older. My parents' wedding was one of the most fun things I've ever been and been part of. I was the flower girl, the maid of honor, the best man, the pianist, and the ring bearer. 
see your parents getting back together and getting remarried really is a dream come true. It was almost something that taught me so much about love and forgiveness. For a long time, I was angry with my dad and very mean to him. Now I was happy for him and living with us and fully involved in our family. Now I know that this is not the story of every kid who has a divorced parent. But I want to remind you that there is restoration among the broken things of this world. Mm. There is so much joy to be found. There are many lessons to be learned. Do not doubt the power of God. Trust in his plan. It may be hard. It may be different than anything you expect. But it may provide just the healing, just the restoration, and just the joy your heart needs. That's the story of a young lady. Yes, it may not happen to everybody that way. It may not. There are many of you out there who would say to me, well, Pastor, that's a great story. But it doesn't work for me. I never had a father. My father left me when I, before I was even born. Or my dad is remarried. I will never come back home again. It's the children of God. Your relationship with your father may never be physically restored, but you can still be reconciled in your heart. And this takes place for all of us when we become children of God. Amen? Amen. For some of you, you may say, well, Pastor, my dad was a good man, but my relationship with him wasn't great. There were lots of gaps in my heart needs and hopes but you know what only jesus christ could fill those holes those gaps and those needs jesus can fill them as we all know the christmas scripture remember the christmas scripture in the book of luke he said his name shall be called what wonderful counselor mighty god Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is the Father that is always present. Jehovah is never absent. He is always present. He will never leave us, nor forsake us. He won't abandon us. And when we call upon him, he will be there for us. I never understood that until I came to Christ. And his perfect love filled the gap in my heart. And will fill the gap in your hearts. Mm -hmm. And this is what the Bible says. It says that when you come to Christ, you receive the spirit of adoption. Amen? Amen. In which you call him what? Abba, Amen. Father. Which means what? Daddy. No matter what you've done, or what he has done to you, you can know that the perfect love of our Heavenly Father will always be there. Amen. And that's what Romans 8, 35 says. It says, can anything ever separate us from the love of God? Does it mean he has, it doesn't mean that he no longer loves you? If you're in trouble, if you're in calamity, or if you're being persecuted or hungry? No. Or destitute or in danger? No. Or threatened with death? No. Because this is what verse 37 says. Verse 37 says, no, despite all these things that are mentioned in verse 35, he said, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Jesus Christ who loves us. Amen? Mm -hmm. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what the challenges are, he will still continue to love you. And verse 38 says, and I am convinced that nothing can never separate us from the love of God, neither death nor life, neither angels no demons neither our fears for today or tomorrow no matter what they are they will never separate us from the love of god and verse 39 says no power in the skies above and above below indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of god that is revealed in christ jesus our lord so nothing will separate us from the love of god are you with me you see, you, you can receive the unconditional love 
of the Father right now by asking Jesus to come into your life and be your personal Savior. Amen. Mm. I will, let me just conclude with this, going back to the, you know, turning the hearts of the Father to the children. What does it mean for a father to turn his heart to his child? And then what is the opposite of that? That the child should turn the hearts of the father. Amen. You see, let me speak to the fathers. Fathers, you can have your heart turned away from the children simply by ignoring them. Okay? By being so, you know, swallowed up in your walk. And all you do is walk, 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 and you neglect the family. You can have your heart torn away from your children by being abusive. It may be that without even hearing yourself, communicating with your children. It may also be abuse in the home, the kids. Okay? It may be that the child doesn't come up to standard according to your own standard. And these, these are the things that turns the heart of the father away from the children. What about the children? The children too can turn their hearts against their parents. How do they do that? They can do that so they've been rebellious by being disobedient to their parents. It doesn't matter if you're 5 or 15 years old, you can turn your heart against your parents. So it's a two way street. As the fathers turn their hearts to the children, the children too should turn their hearts to the parents. Amen? Amen. And they apply to the children, I said, it doesn't matter what the age is. But let's see what God's word, you know, to both parents and the children as I close. Notice it doesn't say that any father or child can turn their hearts. Of the other, all right. So it's not the child's responsibility to turn the father's heart. So, so the child is not the father's responsibility to turn the child's heart to the father. It is our responsibility to because we are in control. We have to take that responsibility. Okay. So turn your heart to your child. <coughs> what does that mean? It means don't give them, you know, all your ills. Okay. The dredges of your life. You know, don't be unkind to your children. Don't constantly criticize them. Don't even think the wicked thoughts that lead because most of the homes are sexual abuse in the home. And let the bitterness go, at least from your side. Forgive and roll the body unto God. Amen? And what about the children? It says, children, do not rebel. Obey. Don't forget them. Do not neglect your, your parents. Because the road to restoration may be a very long one. It may involve extensive steps. It may involve counseling. It may involve Christian therapies. But you have to take that step. That step must be taken. The feeling of having been victimized may cease to justify animosity. So fathers and children, we all have responsibilities. But again, primarily this message is for the fathers. And why is that so important? It is the answer for why our hearts should turn in every one of these cases. Because Jesus was the ultimate victim. We were the ultimate abusers. Our sins near Jesus Christ to the cross. And Jesus has turned his heart towards you and I this morning. And that is the meaning of this message. Whether you look back and remember the love of God, or look forward and see the victory of God. The point comes through. God has turned his heart towards you in Jesus Christ. Don't push it away. It is a sweet and wonderful thing to hold no grudges. And I'll end up by reading verse 6. He says, And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with the gods. The word of God. Amen.